Hi, I'm Jasper Pattenden at Wickham Wanderers, and you're listening to Wickham Sound. The Wickham Wanderers Show. Welcome to the latest edition of the Wickham Wanderers Show on a match day. Unusual. Yes, it is Thursday. Have the bin men come yet? Hope you had a very happy Christmas. And uh, coming up in a slightly abridged version of our usual show, uh, which uh, this week forms part of the match build up to kick off, uh, which is uh, obviously 7.45 this evening down at Plymouth. We'll look back at the Boxing Day victory over Bristol Rovers at Adams Park, which took the club, albeit briefly, into the top six, only outside the playoff spots on goal difference, of course. Uh, lots to look forward to as well, including uh, this evening's game. We'll hear from manager Gareth Ainsworth and David Wheeler, of course, who scored at Adams Park on Boxing Day. We'll get some news from behind the scenes at the club and we'll give you the opportunity to hear part two of our chat with Wickham Wanderers Foundation's new chief executive, Mark Ankirk, on the way as well, uh, including news of a fantastic room which the Wickham Wanderers Ex-Player Association have helped pay for at Adams Park and you might have heard in the news before Christmas as well about the warm hub which does starts next month too. Uh, some other behind the, new, the scenes news from Adams Park to come for you in the next uh, sort of 45 minutes or so as well. And uh, but first, uh, if you uh, were at Adams Park on Boxing Day or were listening to the commentary on Wanderers TV or on Wickham Sound, then uh, you'll have already heard the highlights from that fantastic 2-1 victory over Bristol Rovers. Welcome to Adams Park Boxing Day football. A fantastic tradition here in the UK. Wickham Wanderers taking on Bristol Rovers. Ball down the channel. It's a really good ball now into the box. Finds Mark Wheat. Ball cut back and it's cut. Tapped in by Coburn and Bristol Rovers have the lead. And Street goes long towards Vokes. Vokes with the flick on. Finds McCleary. He's just coming off that right-hand side. McCleary now. has got Mametti on the left. Mametti into Wheeler. Yes! Wickham Wanderers against the run of play. Of equalised here, it was a brilliant move. Folks to head down to McCleary, McCleary to Mametti. Slide rule pass. And in slid David Wheeler into the roof of the net. Wicked one, Bristol one. Fantastic, yeah. I'm completely against the run of play, you have to be honest, but a goal's a goal, we'll take it anywhere we can. Just one thing I want to point out is the weight of pass from Gareth McCleary. As he rolls it into Anis Mametti, it's fantastic. Quite often you see he gives it to feet, but he allows he allows Anis to come onto it first time. As he rolls it into the space, Anis comes onto it, and David Wheeler, as he always did, is the most determined man on the pitch to prod the ball home to give us the equaliser. Get in there. Ball down the lines, a cut out again by a beater. First time clipped clearance towards Scoen. Evans heads the ball back and Scoen gets after it himself and then wins it. And releases Mametti on that left hand side. Mametti, corner of the penalty area. And it's Mametti still going, goes for goal, beaten away, deflection, wing! Yes, it's there! It's a goal! The linesman has given it! Lewis Wing has got his goal! And Anis Sametti, the architect, the keeper, made a brilliant save. But the second ball allowed Lewis Wing to pick his spot. And I think he slammed it into the face of Josh Scoen, which was fortunately a yard behind the goal line. Yeah, thank goodness for that. Goodness me, Scoey in the goal. Takes a whack for his troubles, but he won't mind at all. But yeah, brilliant from Anis Mametti. And the referee blows his whistle. And Wickham Wanderers. And the final home game of the season is an excellent victory. And we'll leave you with the final score. Wickham Wanderers 2, Bristol Rovers 1. So they were the highlights from Boxing Day. I'm very pleased to say we can speak to the man who brought to you those highlights uh, from Adams Park, uh, Phil Catchpole, who of course is the head of audio and broadcast at Wickham Wanderers, host of uh, Ringing the Blues, and uh, of course, as mentioned, uh, our, uh, our match day commentator as well. Uh, very, uh, a very uh, happy season's greetings to you, or whatever the best way of uh, uh, greeting you at this midpoint of between Christmas and New Year is. It seems too, too late to say Happy Christmas, but too early to say Happy New Year. Well, to coin an American phrase, I will say happy holidays, <laughs> one and all. Yes, it's fantastic to have you, have you with us. And it really was a match of, uh, well, certainly eventfulness. In, indeed, sort of going behind so early must have, must have come as a bit of a shock. Yeah, I thought Bristol Rovers started the game really, really well. Um, and Wickham, I thought, were poor first 20 minutes. Um, and Bristol Rovers really pushed forwards. I like the Co- Coburn who scored for them. He, he It's a real handful. Looked like the sort of player that would do well in a Wickham Wanderers team, in fact, on loan for Middlesbrough. Big, mobile, um, decent touch, held the ball up well, brought other runners in. Um, and I thought Joe Barton's tactics were, were spot on how they set up. Um, I thought, you know, they were very fluid in terms of their front four or three players and very difficult to to kind of track the runners. And I thought Collins for them was was a really good standout player. 
um, and was causing all sorts of problems. Um, and interestingly, when they went one that up so early, um, and I have to give credit to the referee because I mean this doesn't happen very often, but uh, I thought the referee, Sonny Girl, was was excellent. Um, he booked someone for time wasting in the eighth minute. Uh, Bristol Rovers got in the lead and then they tried to slow the game down, as every team does, by the way. I know Wickham Wanderers have a reputation for doing so, but um, and hopefully people who listen to me regularly on match commentaries will, will bear this out. But I always say, every team does it and it's up to the officials to stamp it out. And the only way to do that is by issuing cards. And there's no point in waiting till the eighth minute of injury time to do it. Do it when it starts happening and then players get the message. So eighth minute, bang, yellow card. Bradley Collins for taking ages to take a free kick. And then conversely, when Wickham were in the lead, 2-1 in the second half, um, he booked a Wickham player for time-wasting um, immediately as it started happening. So uh, credit to him for that. Um, and that was good to see. Uh, but the goal for David Wheeler really turned things around for Wickham Wanderers because before then I thought they were second best all over the pitch. Um, but the goal was a really well-worked move work involving all four of the front players. Um, and a great bit of desire and um, and, a, and a good run across the, the defender for wheels and a great finish. Uh, and I thought he was a man of the match on the day. I thought um, from 20 minutes onwards, it was a tough call for who was man of the match. But I think David Wheeler edged it for me. I thought he was superb. Um, but then after that, Wickham were, were very, very good. And the start of the second half, our, commenta- our co-coms, Jasper Pattenden on the day, uh, said at half time, he said, look, this game will be won or lost in the first 15 minutes of the second half. And he was absolutely right because Wickham got the goal in the third minute of the second half, a beautiful mirror image of the first, and never really looked in any danger. Um, Bristol Rovers had spells, of course they did, and, and Joey Barton tried to change things up. I thought bringing on McCormick changed things up for them, and but Wickham were able to deal with that threat. Big Max in goal didn't have a huge amount to do in terms of stretching himself, and like I've said before, his positional sense, I'm just in awe of because he, he he just makes saves look really regular and it's because he stood in the right place. He hasn't got a sort of dive across the full length for the goal to tip it around the post. And maybe that's good for the camera. It's not great for the heart rate if you're if you're a Wickham fan, but he seems just to be stood in the right place most of the time, which is, um, I think, probably a good thing for a goalkeeper. Um, a few question marks over his kicking still, but um, I think we're, we're splitting hairs there, really. Um, but as a goalkeeper, I think he's been a superb signing. Um, but a real team effort to see it out. And I spoke to Gareth Ainsworth after the game and, and he was obviously delighted with a, a Boxing Day three points. Listen, I thought uh, that going a little bit more physical today would have been the answer against Bristol. having watched them, you know, very mobile, got a good side, play some real good flowing stuff and some pockets they pick up really well. So I wanted to go mobile in midfield, but then a bit bigger up front. That's why Volksy came in for Brandon. I'm sure there's a few eyebrows raised at that after Brandon's performance last week, but I think it, it, individual games on their merits what what it will take to win a game, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that it was uh, it was proved right. You know, you never know. We might have won by more with Brandon in the in the game, but um, it's uh, it's three points. That's what we came here for today, and uh, and all the fans turned up, got behind us in a real good way. Christmas time has been difficult over the years. For us. We looked at our results recently, and uh, and so that's a great start to the Christmas period. You know, it's a crazy fixture list. Um, but no, Joey's got a good side there, and I think they're going to be up there at the end of the season without a doubt. You know, be competing for these playoffs um, like ourselves. So that's for me is a is a good scalp. He switched it up a bit as well, especially the change of formation. I think, and Wickham started slowly. Was that as a result of uh, as a surprise from Joe Barton? <laughs> no, we we worked on uh, on the new formation in midweek. Um, he's been uh, three at the back quite consistently this season and he came with a four we uh, we worked on that we, we thought it might be a four but that front three you know is very rotational you know I think um, some good players in that front three you know Colburn and, and Collins um, sort of buzzing around uh, Marquis who also was coming really short so I sent Harza to be brave today and step out and, and really you know step in with them into midfield at times and be narrow as fullbacks that's what we worked on this week and uh, and then when we had the chance I thought Voxy would have caused some problems and the first goal proved that and I think um, it was always a threat that he was going to win a flick and get somebody in behind and sometimes you know that's that's the way to play and, and we played that way and we got the three points but um, it's tough because you work on things during the week and there's always the curve balls that come in, you know. But moments like putting Curtis Thompson on on 75 minutes, it means that this club's in a good place and uh, and we've got this squad for the second half of the season coming through, coming strong. Dominic Gabe, Daryl Horgan, Ali Ahmadi not even on, on the on the bench today, you know. So that, that speaks volumes about this place and uh, and I'm really pleased with the results today. But um, I say, 
it's only one game. We've got another one in three days, and then another one two days after that, and that's uh, that's going to be some some tough travelling. Christmas period has been quite slim pickings over the years, um, so hopefully we can get the boys recovered to uh, to give us a good performance at Plymouth. You've alluded to it there with the Brandon Handler and Sam Vokes decision, but now with everybody fit, you've got some tough choices. Yeah, that's the way I want it. You know, I don't want easy choices. I don't want the the days of just being able to put three on the bench or putting m- myself on the bench. They're well gone. You know, I am. Um, the Keurigs have been brilliant, nothing short of brilliant for me and backed me with everything I've, I've asked for and uh, hopefully we can uh, pay them back with some uh, some good performances, some good results, some good finishing positions. I've already had a text from Rob. He's uh, He said I made his boxing day, so that's nice. Um, hopefully I can make his, his 28th and his, his first as well because uh, it'd be great to get um, maximum points, but I'm under no illusion that it's two real tough away trips coming up now and... Uh, and we've got to get the boys firing on all cylinders to get anything out of those games. I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. You've moved into the top six. It might only be for 24 hours because there's another game tomorrow. Is that a big, big boost? It's huge, you know, it's huge. Especially a couple of months ago, people were probably questioning everything. Um, I'd seen my time here and uh, and we were on a bad run and everything, but um, safe to say that Wickham Wanderers are, are still alive and kicking. And uh, like I say, a bit of patience after the big, big names we've lost, the big staff members we've lost. Uh, this club's in a little bit of a transition period. Well, not anymore. I'm safely saying we've come out of that um, and we've got a real good squad, some real good names in there. And uh, really pleased when you got his, his goal as well. Real clever finish that was, you know. In Josh going that he's utmost to stop it on the line, but uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was a brilliant finish. There was only one space he could have hit there. And David Wheeler, I mean, at the moment playing out of his skin, you know, in these positions we keep we keep rotating him in. And uh, and I'm really pleased for all the boys today. It's uh, it's an awesome awesome game. And uh, like I say, I consider that a big big win because Bristol are decent. Really good to hear from the manager, as always. And, and as you touched on, it really felt like you know Wickham improved um, after scoring the first goal. In fact, in the first half, really kind of got into the game as it wore on, really. Yeah, goals change games, don't they? And, and it really sort of gave Wickham a shot in the arm that they needed. It came from nothing against the run of play. Um, but yeah, wonderful goal. Um, as I said earlier, the, the team ethic of it was excellent. Folks, you got the nod ahead of Brandon Hanlon and interesting to hear what Gareth was saying there about the selection headaches he's now got with a full fit squad. Um, Brandon Hanlon scored the winner against top of the table Ipswich Town, but that was then dropped uh, to the bench. Uh, and Gareth Ainsworth was saying, look, it was because I wanted to go more physical against a young set of centre-backs and uh, maybe not as big a physical side uh, in Bristol Rovers as perhaps others are in League One. Um, and obviously with hindsight, we look back on it and go, well, that was a fantastic decision. <laughs> because it's the three points. But we could see that in full effect for the goal because it was a it was a Vokes flick down uh, to McCleary and then Mametti and then Mametti to Wheeler. Uh, and David Wheeler has really, I think, found his position um, in that three behind the, the, the striker. And, and it was good to speak to him after the game as well about that position and also about him becoming a leader for Wickham Wanderers. Another hard-fought win. I think like Bristol Rovers are a solid team, like play some good football. But again, I think the the hard work that we put in, the discipline that we showed, especially in the second half when we were under cosh a little bit, was 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 really good to see. And I think that's 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 given us some consistency in the last few games. Your goal changed things up. It was a slow start for Wickham before then. Yeah, I mean, I still think we had some good good bits. We were threatening a little bit in the first you know early stages. Um, I think someone said that the goal was, was actually offside. So it was a good, it was well worked move by them. But I think he was fractioning offside. But even so, we were, they had a lot of pressure in the first ten fifteen minutes. A little bit slow out the blocks, maybe. Um, but it was nice to see that we we turned the corner in you know, halfway through, and we had we had some good chances ourselves that, that potentially we should have we should have come in um, a couple of goals ahead, maybe. A good team goal as well for you. Uh, you finished off, but a good team, a good move. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we used used Vokes' strengths. Um, he he did his job as he always as he always does, and um, worked it wide. G, you know, G come in, worked it wide to Anis, and Anis put in a great ball for me, and just I just slid in and finished it off. So, yeah, it was. I, I think yeah, when we play to our strengths, we are we are very effective. We got used to you popping up all over the pitch uh, at various points this season, but you look like you've got a settled position now in this team. Yeah, it was a different. It was a different position against there actually, but it may not look like it. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, again, like I'm happy to be valued and to be used in in any way needed. Obviously, you know everyone wants to play in their in their favoured position. But if I can be out there and contribute to the team and and to positive results like the last few we've had, then then I'm happy. 
Some tough choices coming up for the gaffer now because players are coming back from injury and great to see Curtis Thompson coming off the bench today as well for the first time this season. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, as the, sort of the old cliche is, it's, it's a good problem to have. It's great that we've got Kurt, but Kurt's such a solid player at this level. He's, he's no one want to play against him. He's, he's so so dogged in midfield, always wins second balls, and he's, he's just a great presser and, and you know, good on the ball as well. Like he's you know, popped up a couple of goals last last year or so, and yeah, so a, a big big player to come back and yeah, good, good competition. Uh, Gareth Ainsworth describes you now as one of the leaders in the dressing room, albeit uh, a quieter style of leadership to perhaps what was here before in seasons gone past. How do you feel about that? Yeah, it's, it's an honour. It's, it's um, an honour and privilege to, to be in that position. Um, I try my best to, to help players on and off the pitch with any advice, and like you said, possibly a little bit more, a little bit different. To, uh, you know, a Blooms or a or a Bayo where or, or a Darius in the past, and a little, little bit like quieter a little bit more reserved a bit more calm but I like to think that it can be effective in different ways so yeah I, I'm, I'm, it's an honour to be in that position and, and, and to help you know, especially younger players like, to, to improve Plymouth top of the table but you've just alluded to it Wickham in good form as well he must be going there full of confidence yeah I mean we go there we go there full of confidence but we are the underdogs we, we, and that's you know, sometimes where we thrive and we had a really good result there last year, um, so they're going to be one. They're going to be fired up for the game, and you know they're in they're in a, they're in a great place. So, you know, I think I think if we if we get something out of the game, that's that's really really positive for us. It's going to be a very very tough tough game, very very hard to get a win. I think we're capable of getting a win, but um, yeah, we just keep trying to keep the run going that we're on at the minute. I'm really nice to see uh, Lewis Wing on the score sheet as well. Yeah, Wingy was was excellent again. Um, you know, he could really pick a pass and, and give something we could probably haven't had in their locker for, for a few years uh, prior to him joining the club. Um, and he's had to roll his sleeves up and get stuck in, as everybody does in the Wickham Wanderers team. And alongside Josh Scoen, I like that combination because because Scoen does a lot of the dirt, dirty work but can play as well. But Wingy really kind of has a bit of a bit of a class touch about him and, and can really pick a pass. He's got that Hollywood pass in him. And a couple of uh, sighting shots in the first half, uh, uh, well over the bar. But we know he can hit him from range. But the goal was much closer to to um, to the to the goal line. But there was so much to do there because of the nature of it. It was a, a brilliant run by Mametti and a super save actually by James Belshaw in the Bristol Rovers goal. But he was about eight yards out, a very crowded goal mouth, and I think a lot of players um, or the the crowd as well would certainly scream, shoot, um, you know, or just try and absolutely leather it. But I think Wingy just kept his head there, found the gap that was there and just slotted it there. And it just so happened that gap was, uh, that Josh Goins' face was on the end of that gap, but he was fortunately well behind the line. Uh, so it was given. And, and a credit to the assistant referee on the far side as well for flagging so promptly to inform everybody that the ball had indeed crossed the line. Um, but yeah, wonderful finish by Lewis Wing. Um, I think he made it look a lot easier than it actually was. And a really nice reward to see the team in the top six um, at tea time. Unfortunately, just back out of it on goal difference after Derby's draw on Tuesday night. But it just just goes to show, doesn't it, what a good sort of run of form can do. Yeah, I think that was a great shot in the arm, really, for everyone at the club and the fans as well. Because, And also for Gareth Ainsworth, let's not forget that he's been saying that, you know, when the players come back, when the injury crisis is over uh, and and the leaders start to rise again in the in the vacuum that's been left by Adebay Wackenfemmer and Stockdale, of course, that, that things will turn and uh, he's been absolutely right and why wouldn't he be he's been here long enough we should be able to trust him now and he's delivered once more on that we're only halfway through the season so there's no delivery in terms of where we are at. obviously it's nice to be uh, in and around the top six I think we're seventh now as a result of that nil-nil draw between Bolton and Derby and there's teams with games in hand of course but we're on the map with our points total on 23 points we know what we need to do in the second half of the season I don't think we've hit top gear yet. I think maybe we've, we're approaching that at the moment. I think defensively we certainly are and things are looking good. January is going to be a fascinating month in League One because there's going to be teams who've got resource, who've got the, the bigger attendances, the, the budget available to go out there and strengthen their squads. And we'll see what happens in those. And, you know, I think it'll be the likes of Sheffield Wednesday and Ipswich possibly who who could well be the automatic promotion places come May. Well, they, they absolutely should be really when you look at what they've got available to them. So it could then be the scrap for the playoffs and Wickham have got the streetwise knowledge of how to do it with Gareth Ainsworth and, and a few of the squad members as well who are still around. So it's going to be a fascinating month, January. I think by the end of January, 
it's going to be a really good indication as to what Wickham can achieve this season because we've got some tough fixtures coming up, crossing into the new year. Um, we've got the week off at the start of January, but then um, then after that, we'll see where we are at the end of the month, both in terms of who's in the Wickham squad, be it people leaving, be it people coming in, and where we are with the points total and whether we are still in that sixth place or that seventh place or whether we're going to have to crack into the top six. Because it's no good being in there in January, as we all know, at the end of last season. We got in on the last day of the season and that was enough to get us to Wembley. Um, so if we were to get a repeat of that again, I'd take it right now. Things are set up really nicely. And of course, a big test uh, this evening with the league leaders. We, we played the league leaders recently, but, but that was Ipswich. Uh, and Plymouth, obviously, in, in decent form, although you know they've shown that they are beatable as well. Well, yeah, they've had a few injury problems and, you know, blow and behold, you lose some of your players and, and the results uh, start to drop off a little bit. Uh, they've drawn a few, they lost uh, a couple as well, but, you know, they've got an excellent manager down there and I think they're the best run club in the EFL. I look at Plymouth off the pitch and, and see what they do and, you know, they've sold out their homestand at the home end for uh, for this game against Wickham Wanderers. OK, it's a Christmas fixture, they're top of the league. If they can't sell it out now, when then when... When could they? But, you know, it's a big ground. It's a bit of a sleeping giant. You know, they've been down in the in the bottom leagues for quite some time now. But I think they're doing great things down there. But Wickham tend to do great things down there as well. They did beat us at Adams Park earlier in the season against the runner players, a game that Wickham should have won on the balance of chances. But credit to Plymouth that day. They came with a game plan to negate Wickham's physical approach. And I think that was the first time it was a bit of a reality check for Wickham Wanderers that finally, after hearing managers week on week saying, oh, we know what we're going to expect with Wickham Wanderers, and then subsequently doing nothing about it and losing. Uh, credit to, to Schumacher at Plymouth because he he said, I know what we're going to expect, and then changed it up and just put all these big players out on the pitch and beat Wickham at their own game. Since then, Gareth Ainsworth and Richard Dobson have come up with a couple more approaches for Wickham Wanderers. And I wouldn't mind betting that Brandon Hanlon starts um, possibly tonight to try to get behind the the, the defence and try and catch them out. Um, I think sometimes the tag that Wickham get with or we know what we're going to get is slightly unfair. Um, but it's interesting now that, that teams do come and set up a bit like Wickham Wanderers, um, which is interesting. You mentioned the 23 games, halfway point of the season, 35 points. You've been speaking to, to Rob Kuig, which um, fans can catch on, on Wanderers TV. Uh, I'm sure an interesting chat to sort of see see where we are at the halfway point of the season. It's always interesting to chat to Rob. Um, he, he's got that wonderful kind of um, outsider's view, if if you get him adrift in a, in a good way, because he lives on the other side of the world. Um, he's recently into football in, in the last three years. He's learned an incredible amount about the game on and off the pitch, I think, by his own admission as well. Um, but he's incredibly sort of open and frank, quite an American approach to being interviewed, which I really enjoy talking to him about. Uh, everything's on the table and it's it's good to have a chat with him. You know, changes off the pitch. We often refer to his sort of relentless optimism when it comes to where Wickham will be. And, you know, so far, so good. You know, since he's been in charge of the club, um, his relentless optimism has borne out. Um, I think a few people were starting to doubt it at early stages of this season, but look where they are now. Um, and it'd, it'd be, uh, I don't want to spoil it, but yeah, go and go on the Wickham Wanderers uh, website. You can watch this interview if you've not seen it already. And, and lo and behold, he's tipping us for promotion. And obviously, it's nice to kind of reflect on the first half of the season, but also this time of year, kind of 2022. And there must be some real moments that stand out for you, uh, not least the, the trip to Wembley. Yeah, well, you know, Wembley was obviously a bittersweet day. Um, a great occasion for any club in the lower leagues to get themselves to a playoff final. It wasn't to be on the day. Um, I think, you know, as we've gone over in the past, Sunderland fully deserved to win on the day. It wasn't Wickham's day in, in any respect. And uh, and that was tough to take. And I think that's caused a slight hangover coming into the season as well. Um, and, and that's now out of the system well and truly, which is which is good to see. But Wickham aren't unique in that respect. But let's not forget the run that got us to Wembley because, you know, a fabulous... 14, 15 game run unbeaten at the end of the season uh, to get themselves into that into that sixth position on the final day of the season as well. Uh, in quite a calm manner, when when I sort of say that now, it sounded like it would be absolutely incredibly exciting. And of course it was. But really, I think, think down a lot of us knew that it was going to happen. Um, and Gareth Ainsworth certainly did and believed it. And it's wonderful to see, you know, his calmness rewarded in that respect because... Every time I speak to him about pressure, he says he always goes back to the Torquay game and Wickham nearly went out of the Football League and, and would have probably gone out of business. He was like, that's pressure. He says, what we're doing here isn't pressure. You know, of course it is. He's just sort of watering it down a bit. But in perspective, which is a big word that Gareth Ainsworth likes to use, I can I can see where he, what he means with it. But it was great to be involved in that run um, and, and to see it unfold. 
Um, and who knows? We could be relying on that experience again next year. Uh, uh, yeah, next year. It is still next year, isn't it? We're still in 2022. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna check my calendar. I never do know what day it is, Colin, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so it's it's that that confidence that kind of from from that run at the end of the last season that Wickham can use, not just the players, but the fans and everyone around the club as well. Um, so yeah, some highlights really with, with that run, the win at Burton, the celebrations afterwards, the fabulous night at home in the first leg of the semi-finals against MK Dons, where it was a brilliant game, a brilliant evening for the club. It was packed out at Adams Park, Wickham played superbly well. And then the nerve shredding second leg at Stadium MK, not quite so enjoyable during the game. After the match, um, wonderful scenes and they will live on in the in the memories of Wickham fans forever, be it if they were watching at home or uh, if they were one of the lucky few that were allowed into the cavernous, uh, empty seated arena uh, in Milton Keynes. And for reasons that you touched on, you know, plenty of uh, reasons for optimism going into 2023. Uh, as you say, a big month coming up with the likes of Peterborough and Sheffield Wednesday, Bristol Rovers again, Oxford, of course, uh, and not forgetting Fleetwood. Yeah, I think. Yeah, to use the cliche, there's no easy games in this division. Um, and I think that run just completely underlines it, doesn't it? Um, Peterborough have struggled um, for, for form of late and their manager's no doubt under pressure. Uh, and Wickham Wanderers go there at the first game of the year. Hopefully they can put a marker down and and and, and get a great result there. Uh, who knows what's going to happen this evening away at Plymouth. But, you know, you never bet against Wickham in those situations. But yeah, some tough runs. I think what's really handy is that weekend off the 7th of January because it's a it's an intense fixture schedule over January uh, over Christmas and coming into January and having that first weekend off may be a good position to get everybody fit uh, and rested and raring to go uh, for what will hopefully be a superb run in, in the second half of the season. And uh, and yeah, I think it's going to be pretty spicy down at Bristol Rovers so soon after them losing at Adams Park. Well, enjoy the game tonight. Uh, brilliant to speak to you. Thank you so much, Lee, for your time. Cheers, Colin. Happy New Year to everybody and to you as well. Happy New Year to you. Uh, also, uh, Phil will be back a little later on this evening. Uh, your match build-up starts after us and uh, live commentary on Wickham Sound on 106.6 and on Wanderers TV from 7.45 from Plymouth. And, of course, you can catch the uh, full interviews with Gareth and uh, David Wheeler and, of course, Rob Kuig on Wanderers TV. Online, on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM. This is Wickham Sound. <laughs> second part of this week's Wicked Wanderer show a little shorter as it forms in essence uh, part of the build up to our live commentary this evening from Plymouth Argyle uh, against Wickham in League One which is on the way some news from behind the scenes at the club you might have heard that uh, they're strengthening their football operations structure at Adams Park with the appointment of Andrew Howard as sporting advisor to the chairman and chief executive the former chairman and sporting director of the club will work uh, with Pete Kuig Gareth Ainsworth and club secretary Tom Holder as well to advise Rob Kuig on football business matters uh, it says on the club's website in order to achieve success in key areas they include the management of the playing budget and assisting with negotiations recruitment plans and succession planning as well Uh, lots to uh, look forward to and uh, Gareth Ainsworth in uh, some uh, quotes on the website said Andrew is someone that he's hugely enjoyed working with previously and he was a real mentor and supporter of him during his earlier years in management Uh, Andrew uh, himself uh, said that the club has gone from strength to strength since Rob took over and uh, he's excited to be able to help going forward. Gareth and Pete have done a great job and he looks forward to working with the team in an advisory capacity. Uh, Hopefully we'll get to chat to him on the Wickham Wanderer show going forward as well. Uh, News that Phil Alexander is leaving uh, next month as well to become Chief Executive of Bristol City. Uh, You might uh, see more information on that as well on the club's website. If you're listening to last week's show, you'll have heard part one of our chat with Mark, who's the Chief Executive of the Wickham Wanderers Foundation and Kirk as well. Really do some great stuff in the community, uh, including, you might have heard before the uh, Christmas break, that uh, there was some uh, news about the Warm Room, which is coming to Adams Park. More on that in a few moments' time as well. But we start with uh, a great collaboration with the Wickham Wanderers Ex-Players Association and the Reardon Room, uh, which is coming to Adams Park uh, next month as well. We're based at Adams Park at the stadium with the the football club. We've got got two rooms. One of those is primarily where most of our our team work on a day-to-day basis, and then the second room is sort of an an extension of that. So it's it's often used as as a meeting room. But primarily, it's it's a it's a project room, so it's almost like like a classroom, a very functional learning space. Now, 
it's fair to say when I joined the club, it was it was a little bit tired. It, it needed a, needed a facelift, and there'd been a, a project in uh, in the making of of turning that room into a memorial room for 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 a club legend named John Reardon. And the ex-players and um, some of the Reardon family had, have kindly donated some money for us to enhance and improve that room, which which we've done. And and there'll be an official opening of that room sort of very early next year. And the room's now, I, I think, really, really fantastic and, and multi-purpose. You know, we're, we're going to be delivering a degree program in there. We've brought groups of kids to the program. Us as a team use it for various different things. It's a, it's a really functional learning space that's going to really benefit lots of different people within the community. And, and, and also, I think it's a fitting tribute to, to Mr Wickham, you know, John Reardon, who was, I think, the only person who's ever been a, a player, a coach, a manager, and the club secretary of the club. So, you know, obviously had a, a really deep-rooted connection and love to the club. So we're, we're delighted to be able to, to honour him appropriately. Tell us about some of the other projects that you've got coming up. Where to start? We're, um, we're delivering a, a, a project in, in, a, in a prison in the new year, a Level 1 coaching course. So we're going into a, a local prison to help support and, and, and upskill some offenders in there to, to support them if, if they're sort of re integration into into society with with a new skill set so i think that's great we've got a program called gulp which is about raising awareness of high sugar drinks and trying to reduce the intake within within young people so that's launching as well we have got a uh, a warm hub initiative which um, is a cost of living crisis initiative between the foundation uh, and the football club, which Dreams, the official sponsor of the club, have, have kindly supported and, and, and funded. We're working with the local council on it as well to try to, to tackle, A, it's very cold <laughs> at the moment, and the cost of living in terms of um, sort of people's utility bills. As we all know, it's very difficult for all of us at the moment. Um, so through January and February, we're going to be opening up some rooms in the stadium twice a week for over 65s with a plus one to come down to the stadium get a free meal, save some money on, on, on their heating, and it will be a, a sort of a real social space with lots of activities going on and, and to try to have that, that, that social focus as well. We're, we're going to put some family day dates within the two months where we're running that initiative. So there'll be dates where it will be for over 65s with a plus one and then some dates where it will be open to, to, to families and anyone who wants to come down to, to enjoy, the, enjoy the warm hub. And Kirk, you must find as well that the reaction of the people that you work with is so sort of rewarding for you as well. Oh yeah, without a doubt, some of the players that we're we're working with uh, very much enjoy what we do. We very much enjoy working with them, um, and some of the players we've worked with literally are, are with us for maybe maybe ten years. We're currently involved with a a, prog- a program with the the Henley College, uh, where it's a football educational program um, where they can do the football side with Wigan Wanderers, but also uh, their their ac- academic side there with the Henley College. And some of those students that we're working with within that program are now currently 18, 19. Uh, but myself and, and my team, we started working with some of those players when they were aged seven and eight. Um, so we've we worked with them for maybe eight, eight or nine seasons now within the EDA, or their first introduction was a Saturday morning club. Um, and it's great to still be part of their football journey, even at that age. And Mark, it's, it's great to see that, you know, even something like perhaps a first team player going to a school and just the, the kids' reaction, or, you know, as Kirk said, just someone's progress is in developing in, in their own game as well. Yeah, I think first team players and, and, and our fantastic manager, you know, they're really passionate too about sort of supporting the, the community provision that happens at the club and, and we have regular player appearances at, at our programmes and I think players probably don't quite fully realise the impact that that has on, on young people just just seeing them even just for five minutes. It's it's very aspirational for the, for the people that get to meet them. And, uh, you know, we, for instance, recently, uh, Lewis Wing uh, won a... Uh, won an executive box for for a game at the the club golf day, and uh, he kindly donated it to the foundation. Now we um, we took a group of our our guys from our, our mental health program. It's called Keep Moving Forward. They're they're down at the allotment on a weekly basis, and, and you know some of them have had difficult times and challenging times, and and, and that program has been a, a key part of, of of helping them sort of improve their mental health, etc. Um, and some of them had never been to a football match before and their first time at a football match was, was in a box um, and then they got to meet Lewis after the game on the pitch and, and, and to me sort of seeing their faces um, that day was, was again really satisfying and rewarding for us so it's, it's just great to be able to, to link the, the club 
and the players, etc., with with their with their community. And how that stays with people. I was speaking to a friend of mine recently who, who said it was a brilliant day when Steve Guppy came to school and did some coaching and uh, got to speak to Steve recently and I relayed that story to him. And he was quite disappointed because he didn't think his coaching in those days would have been so good uh, as it is now. And he, he feels he could have let that, 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 that yeah. class down a bit. But it, literally that was probably more than 30 years ago. And, and people still talk about that now. Yeah, I mean, I think they are, they are memories for life when, when those sorts of things happen. And, and the one I've just described will be a memory for me. You know, like I said, genuinely seeing their, their faces and... And their faces not only at the start of the day, but at the very end of the day, you know, even after what was maybe not the first the, the result that we were hoping for on the pitch, because I think it was a draw. Um, it was a draw with Morecambe that day. But yeah, really, really great experience. And, and like you say, lifelong memories. So, Kirk, what's the main message you'd like to get across to people about the, the work that you do? Just the, the activities that we, we deliver, um, it's, it's all about fun and enjoyment. That's, that's always the biggest message, whether you've never played football before, whether you're you know, a strong performer within your sort of junior club team. Everything that we deliver um, is, is geared around fun and enjoyment. Um, whatever you do in life, is, is, it's, it's got to be that message. Um, so that's, that's the biggest takeaway I, I would say to our players. Whatever you do, just make sure you enjoy yourself. And Mark, similarly, what, what would you hope to kind of get across to people about the, the foundation and sort of what it stands for and, and how people can benefit? Oh, good, good question. I think a key message for, for us would be we want to spread the word, really, about about the foundation. You know, when when I when I joined, we were we were known as Wick and Wanderer Set, um, or Set for short. Which, look, I think without context or an explanation, perhaps that was what was limiting our our message getting out there of, of what we're doing and the great work that the foundation is doing. So we've we've recently rebranded to, to Wick and Wanderers Foundation, which sort of aligns us alongside the, the football club with, with sort of their website and social media, etc. So we're really hoping that that's going to help our story to, to reach more people. And, and ultimately, we're a charity, you know, so we're, we're reliant on, we've got some great volunteers, we're reliant on, on donations and, and people getting involved with, with what we're doing. So we hope that the rebrand will, will spread our, our message because I was, I was told we're one of the best kept secrets in, in Bucks, which is not what we want to be. We want to be... Hopefully the uh, secret's out now. The secret's out. We want everyone to know about the great work that, that we're doing and, and the football club are doing. So look, if people would like to get involved, reach out. You know, they can find us on our, on our website, you know, wickandwanderersfoundation.co.uk. Um, and there's lots of ways people can, can get involved and, and help spread the word because if we can spread that word, you know, we can hopefully de- deliver more provision, which means more impact. Mark and Kirk from the Wickham Wanderers Foundation speaking to us here at Wickham Sound. Online, on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM, this is Wickham Sound. Normally this will be the final part of the Wickham Wanderers show, but a shorter edition of the programme this week because of our coverage of the game at Plymouth. We'll have full live coverage and commentary a bit later on. Our build-up starts in a couple of moments' time. Uh, the show, of course, returns next week when we'll be looking back at what's happening this evening and, of course, uh, reviewing the action at Peterborough as well. There's a podcast version of the show wherever you get your podcasts from so you can listen at your leisure. You can follow it on YouTube or, indeed, the Wickham Sound radio player page or on our website, Wickham Sound .org.uk there's a listen again feature there as well I look forward to catching up with you next week but now we continue with our match build up to tonight's game with full match commentary from Phil Catchpole